Hi, welcome back to Space Thoughts. Um, I have a rather exciting video this morning uh, talking about the Artemis Accords. Uh, few, I've done a couple of videos over the past couple of months about the Artemis Accords and some efforts to counter the Artemis Accords, like the, Van the Vancouver recommendations. Uh, but right now, I'm going to talk about the Artemis Accords as an actual signed agreement, and not just signed by one or two NATO states, but by eight states. So uh, this is pretty exciting. It was this is an, it was unexpected to see this many states signing on to them initially, but um, it's real. It's actually getting real, and uh, it's pretty. I'm pretty enthusiastic about you know moving forward on how these are going to work out. Now. Um, the Artemis Accords were signed officially on October 13th by all eight states involved, including the United States. And in fact, this was brought up at the International Astronomical Convention, which is being held virtual because of what's going on right now. But uh, they're signed and they're in effect. And what I'm going to do in this video is I'm going to actually look at the some parts of the Accords. We actually have the text of the Accords now, the, the uh, copies of the actual signed agreements. And I, what I'll do is I'll put a link to those in the description once we're done. But what I want to do today is just go over a few few parts of the Artemis Accords. I'm not really going to go. I'm not going to go super deep into them and do a a real deep dive and pull them apart. I'm going to actually save that for a special issue of my briefing letter, the Pressy, probably in in a few weeks. But I'm going to highlight a few things that I think are important. Now I'm going to preface this with with, with speaking to space resources because ultimately I think the Artemis Accords are geared towards how space resource activity is accomplished and basically, you know, basically setting, you know, rules or principles for space resource utilization and extraction. So in other words, this is both this is both for go state actors, governments, government agencies like NASA, ESA, or other uh, other space agencies, but it's also geared for private in uh, private entities, government entities for actual space resource extraction to convert space resources into profit. So in my opinion, this is how the Artemis Accords are framed and this is how uh, they're going to go moving forward. So I'm going to talk about, so when I, when I talk about this, I'm going to be framing this a lot in the term of space resources, but at the same time, uh, we're going to we're going to talk about the effect of international law at the end of it. So I made a little presentation here to go with it. And here we go. So this is a clip from the actual site of the actual uh, first document of the Artemis Accords. And what's really interesting is that it says the Artemis Accords principles for cooperation in civil exploration and use of the moon, Mars, comets, and asteroids for peaceful purposes. Now, first thing I want to bring to everybody's attention is not only this doesn't the whole idea of the Artemis Accords well think, well, this is about the moon and nothing else. However, the way things were negotiated and some of the some of the concerns that were raised by other parties uh, during the negotiation, from my, my understanding, is if, they're go if we're going to do this, we're going to talk about everything up there. That includes Mars, comets, and asteroids. So the principles in the Artemis Accords basically apply to all these bodies. In other words, exploration, uh, civil exploration, and use. And when I talk about use, we're talking about space resources, which is why I'm going to weigh very heavily on these are the eight signatories. Now, I see a lot of media talking about the seven the seven signatories. Well, there are eight because the United States signed two on, on October 13th, along with every, along with the others. And I'm going to go through these uh, real quickly. Obviously, the United States, the Grand Ducky of Luxembourg, and the United Arab Emirates. And now, I have these three listed up top specifically because these three states have domestic space resource laws. They've actually signed domestic laws, and they're on the books. So fundamentally, they're, they're coming into this saying, we already have laws on the books, and this is going to help facilitate us, you know, actually making these laws, putting these laws into action with private entities. The United Kingdom is a signer. Japan which is a signer, and I've speculated that Japan would, would sign on to these. In fact, I thought they'd probably be the first one and probably the only one. Surprise, I was wrong. Uh, it's a good surprise. I'm glad, I'm glad I was wrong to see uh, eight signatories instead of just one or two. Canada, which has always been a partner uh, to for the U.S. with uh, in space activities, ISS, uh, the Space Shuttle Program, Space Hab, uh, they provided the robotic arm for the space shuttles and, of course, the robotic arms for uh, this, the International Space Station. Uh, interestingly, uh, I, we talked about the Vancouver pro uh, recommendations, and I made a video about this several months back, which basically came out. Uh, right along the right up before the uh, executive order on space resources back on April 4th 
It's interesting because that recommendation was urging the, the Canadian government to go for a multilateral framework at the international, in other words, a top-down approach versus this bottom-up approach. And guess what? Uh, Canada signed on to the Artemis Accords, and in my opinion, that's pretty much rejecting that whole idea of a multilateral framework or a multilateral regime. And I'll talk about this a little bit more at the end. Uh, Italy, which has been an active uh, player in U.S. space activities, a partner in space activities, a space shuttle in particular, and of course other other aspects, and Australia. And I list Australia last, not because it's the least. Certainly, it's an important contributor and, and ally geopolitically as well. But because I, Australia is a is basically a party to the Moon Agreement, they acceded to it, which means they're basically legally bound by the Moon Agreement. And I have some. And I think there's some conundrums there, and I'll go into this a little bit more detail uh, towards the end of the video on why I think this is kind of uh, an interesting development with Australia and what might actually occur. So with that, we're going to look at some of the aspects of the Artemis Accords that I think are important, and we'll go from there. This is the, this is the table of contents. Basically, this is all the sections of the Artemis Accords, and there's 13 sections here. Uh, they're all self-explanatory. I'm not going to go through every one of these again for sake of time. However, again, I mentioned my briefing letter. I will be doing a special issue for it. So for those of you who are subscribers, you can look to see that in your e email box in the next couple of weeks, I uh, de depending on my schedule, where I'm going to go down and I'm going to break down the Artemis Accords. I'm going to go through all these sections and comment on them uh, in particular. But understand, this is actually taken from the Artemis the, the document, the Artemis Accords, and this is the table of contents. Basically, this is what it consists of, and these are the principles and what it addresses. I'm going to jump right to section two about implementation, and basically, it, it basically discusses what this agreement, what kind of what the form of this agreement is. Now, fundamentally, at a very basic level, the Artemis Accords are what we call executive agreements. In other words, they're agreements entered to entered into between by the executive branch and its agency, the agencies under it. And fundamentally, they go out and they make these agree agreements. And essentially, they're kind of political agreements in the sense, we're going to go out and we're, we're going to make these agreements with other states. But Cong unlike a treaty, Congress doesn't have to weigh in. They don't have to give their advice and consent, and it doesn't have to be ratified. In other words, the agencies can come, the, the executive branch can go out and make these agreements. And whether or not they come legally binding is interesting, um, but I, uh, I'll talk about that a little bit later. I have some I have some ideas about that. Uh, another example of a executive agreement that w was considered was the U EU Code of Conduct and the international and and it's fought the follow on agreement after the EU Con uh, Code of Conduct kind of fizzled. Uh, the international Code of Conduct that would if that had come to fruition, if the U.S. had signed onto that, it would have been an executive agreement. I.e., wouldn't have to have Congress's advice and consent, nor would it have to be ratified. And it wouldn't be, quote, legally binding. It wouldn't become a legally binding treaty. So understand, this is a different animal than a treaty. It gives a lot more flexibility. And it's very, it's very, it's very uh, malleable. It it's, uh, has a lot of mobility in, in how, it's, how it's applied. Um, fundamentally, it, the, the, this creates the nature of the Artemis Accords. Basically, this is a foundational agreement. This isn't a do-all and end-all for space activities. Basically, it's a foundational agreement saying, okay, this is our foundational agreement, and what we're going to do is, uh, from, there, from there, we're going to build on with other instruments, other, you know, state-to-state -state interests. We're going to bypass the United Nations altogether, but we're going to go in and uh, negotiate. So, in other words, um, we have the, the signatories to the accords, but basically, you know, may down the road say, okay, we need to talk about, you know, such and such an activity or how we're going to interact. Let's have an agreement. And oh, by the way, we're going to, based on the Artemis Accords, uh, our, our prior commitment to the Artemis Accords, we're going to initiate this agreement, whether it's memorandum of understanding or or else. So fundamentally, what this said, what, what this does is sets up a baseline agreement for other agreements to build on. And this this is actually a frame a framework for other to build on for other treaties. And really, the Artemis Accords, in a sense, is building onto the framework of the Outer Space Treaty, the Registration Convention, the Liability Constra uh, Convention, and the Rescue Agreement. So we're, build we're, we're taking that international framework, we're building this, this bilateral framework here this, this, with, uh, with the Artemis Accords, <coughs> excuse me, 
and we will be building from there we're going to build on with other agreements so in essence this is a core agreement that's built on international law that will move forward outside of the UN and outside of Copius that isn't to say that the US won't you know we won't be engaging with Copius of course we will that's something that will you know con that will be uh, a continuation but the idea is this won't be negotiated in the UN this will be negotiated outside the UN system including all the other successive uh, agreements to come and, and, the, and the, the, the sky's the limit no pun intended with you know the number of agreements or the types of agreements that can be created based on the Artemis Accords themselves I'm going to jump right I'm going to go through uh, skip a bunch of the other principles um, related to other topic areas because I wanted to go right to space resources because like I said I think in my opinion space resources is really the fundamental reason why the Artemis Accords are coming to being and I think rip personally the Artemis Accords were really um, a successor or, or basically a result or part of the executive order issued on April 4th about the uh, about the space resources which basically rejected the moon agreement and, and such so fundamentally, this is fulfilling executive policy from uh, actually a directive from the White House. The Artemis Accords kind of fulfilled that that function. And hence, I think why space resources are really at the core of the Artemis Accords. People are going to disagree with me, with me on that's fine. Um, but this is my opinion. The space resources are really the crux of why we have this. Um, and I'm just going to go through these four paragraphs. The signatories note that the utilization of space resources can benefit humankind by providing critical support for safe and sustainable operations. So we're, we're talking about use here, and use has, in, in my opinion, has two faces, use for, in what we call in situ, for supporting operations, and use for, which has create, been created by domestic law for uh, actually gaining possession of space resources and turning a profit. Now, uh, I'm probably gonna end up doing a video, I think I've talked about this before, but Fundamentally, there are two sides to use, and this is basically, in my opinion, what this is talking about. Two, the signatories emphasize that the extraction and utilization of space resources, including any recovery from the surface or subsurface of the moon, Mars, comets, or asteroids, should be executed in a manner that complies with the Outer Space Treaty and in support of safe and sustainable space activities. And there you go, basically reiterating that the, the Artemis Accords are basically based on the Outer Space Treaty. And fundamentally, in other words, we're not abrogating it. We're not withdrawing from it. The Outer Space Treaty is there. However, we're looking at it as a permissive document, as a framework, and not necessarily a restrictive document that says, thou shalt not do this, or thou shalt do this, or thou can do this. Fundamentally, it's a framework, and the Artemis Accords are building on it and reiterating that this year. The signatories commit to inform the Secretary General of the United Nations, as well as the public and international scientific community, of their space resource extraction activities in accordance with the Outer Space Treaty. So, in other words, we're still we're still keeping an open dialogue with the with with the United Nations and COPUS, which is the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, uh, on the on space resource extraction activity, and that includes government use, uh, use by government for supporting activities and use by private citizens for possession and converting to profit of, of space resources. So the, again, the two phases of use there. And, and again, we're keeping in touch with the international, with, with that international body, but we're not involving that international body in the actual negotiations of successing agreements. Four, the signatories intend to use their experience under the accords to contribute to multilateral efforts to further develop international practices and rules applicable to the extraction and utilization of space resources, including the ongoing efforts at the COPUS. Fundamentally, one thing I was looking for in here that I didn't see was anything that was talking about a multi-level or a multilateral regime, overarching regime to govern the extraction of space resources. And I consider that highly significant because that's something that the Vancouver recommendations have been we're pushing for and there's also a letter that went out uh, a letter that was signed by notable experts and academics um, uh, from former diplomats to to the extent to the UN general secretary that the UN passed a resolution calling for an international framework this basically says we doesn't say anything about a multilateral regime or framework and again I get back to the building blocks uh, I've again I've been critical of those for the simple fact that they're looking for a regime which is exactly what the moon agreement looks is looking for and I'll talk about that in, in a little bit later in the video 
Um, but fundamentally, this tells me as we go out and actually start doing doing space res uh, space resource extraction utility, whether it's through supporting lunar activities uh, or so, or basically uh, space resource extraction for profit. As we get as, as we go on to these things and we learn things, we're going to pass those practices along. And we, we may not necessarily make agreements, but we're going to be, these practices may actually become customary international law. In other words, unwritten law or on the way things are, or I hate to use the term, but I'm going to use it, rules of the road for space resource activity. So the idea is instead of setting rules beforehand about this is how you're going to do it before you even started to do it, as you do it and as you learn and gain experience, you set up rules, you set up you set up processes, you set up procedures, and you develop that into customary international law, and that eventually becomes ingrained in as part of the jurisprudence of outer space law in terms of space resources and further amplifies uh, the effect of the Outer Space Treaty. So I think that's highly significant. Um, I'm going to jump right to the final section, Section 13, final provisions, building on any consultative mechanisms and pre-existing arrangements as appropriate. The signatories commit to periodically consult to review the implementation of the principles in these accords and to exchange views on potential areas of future cooperation. In other words, we're not going to look at the, 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 the accords are going to be there, but they're not going to be static. In other words, the, the, the signatories to the accords may come back and look at them periodically and say, okay, based on our experience, do we need to modify the accords? Or, you know, do we need to, or do we need another agreement to actually supplement the accords. So in other words, these aren't going to be static. These could be potentially amended to meet, you know, concerns of, of, of partners or to reflect further experience. Now, this is a lot, doing this would be a lot easier and a lot, lot more politically palatable than saying amending the Outer Space Treaty. And I hear this a lot. Well, we got to amend the Outer Space Treaty, or we got to amend the Moon Agreement, or we got to amend these, this other treaty. Amendment, even though it is permitted in, 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 all, the, in all these treaties, this is a pretty standard clause. Politically, it's a it's a huge hurdle, and it, and sometimes it takes longer to negotiate amendment than it does to negotiate the original treaty. So, treaty the, the treaty process that's one of the reasons I don't like it. It's very cumbersome, and and it just takes a long time. And by the time you get things done, uh, it's the, the question is okay. What do, now that we have it, what do we do with it? With the Artemis Accords, because they're not a treaty, because in a sense they're quote non-binding, they're pro and, and because these. These uh, parties have negotiated between themselves outside of uh, a highly a highly charged political environment like the UN. They are probably going to be able to amend these a lot easier. Uh, the government of the United States will maintain the original text of the accords and transmit to the Secretary General of the United Nations a copy of these of these accords, which is not eligible for registration under Article two, 102 of the Charter of the United Nations, with a view to its circulation to all the members of an organization as an official document of the UN. In other words. This is going to, the Artemis Accords is going to become, in a sense, part of the international legal framework. We're going to give it to the UN, and the UN is going to disseminate to all the members. And fundamentally, this is going to become part of uh, the UN collection of, of documents relating to space law. This is what I interpret. This is my opinion. And after October 13, 2020, any state seeking to become a signatory to these accords may submit its signature to the government of the United States for addition to its tech, to this text. So in other words, the United States is going to, write, is going to be because they basically initiated the idea of the accords, is going to be the go-to place if you if a state wants to sign on to it. And my feeling is now that we have quote eight states that have that have signed on to the Artemis Accords, um, there are going to be other states look, looking at it and saying, hmm, this is kind of fun. It's kind of like when you when you when you when you throw you know a throw party. Sometimes a lot of people aren't interested, but when they see when when they see some people uh, certain people there, or see larger groups starting to develop, saying maybe I should be part of that party, and decide to at least give it a look and and join in. And I think that's what's going to happen with the Artemis Accords. I think you're going to see a lot more signatories uh, joining this uh, in the near future, especially as we get closer to actually getting back to the moon and starting activities there. So what do the Artemis Accords mean for the moon agreement and international law in general? Well, I'm going to take that backwards. What does it mean for international law in general is that treaties in terms of outer space are going to be put on the back burner, probably for a long time, because treaties are very cumbersome. They take a long time to negotiate. When you have a multi multiplicity of parties who want to get their opinions in, um, it can get pretty convoluted, and geopolitics and national interests definitely figure into it. Um, then you got to go through the ratification process, which gets things highly political, 
uh, especially with, in our case, Congress. Congress, has, if it's going to be ratified, it has to go through Congress and go through, basically give their advice and consent before the president can actually sign it and, and ratify it. Uh, and other countries have their own ratification process as well. So treaties really are passe, uh, I think, in, in terms of outer space law. The Artemis Accords, however, executive agreements like this are the way forward because they're very re they're very flexible. They they respond fast to change. In other words, if like I said, as we as we go as we go along and start performing lunar activities or activities on, on asteroids or comets or Mars or whatever, um, you know, certain certain things are going to come up saying, oh, you know, we really got you know we didn't expect this. We got to address it. How can we you know? And maybe we should have some sort of formal you know protocol about this. Let's go back to the Artemis Accords and either, you know, amend them or write an additional agreement to supplement the Artemis Accords on that as well. So in that sense, the Artemis Accords and exec executive agreements like the Artemis Accords are very flexible. They, they respond to things. And bottom line is they get things done. Treaties are very cumbersome and, and it's almost like you get it done and it's like, okay, now what? With executive agreements, you have you have an end already in mind of what you want to do and the or what you want to get done, so you get it done. So I think executive agreements are more like contracts, in in a business sense than treaties are. Even though treaties are contracts, in a sense, um, executive agreements like the Artemis Accords are more 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 responsive, reflexive contracts for say the business world. You got to address a business problem or the business situation. You write you write a contract. So I think. In this case, um, the Artemis Accords are going to change the way international law is done. Fundamentally, I think what's going to happen is a lot of the practices in the Artemis Accords that come out as they get as they start going are going to become accepted and become customary international law. In other words, they'll become legally binding. And this has happened in other domains. This has happened in the oceans. Uh, even though I'm, I'm loath to actually compare, you know, any terrestrial environment to outer space. One example is the ocean, where practices over over centuries actually became custom, customary international law. And in the case of uh, a lot of that, they became actually codified in the law of the sea. Um, I don't know if that's going to happen with something like the Artemis Accords or not. Um, in the air, the civil, uh, you know, basically the, the treaties and the rules on civil aviation came for international civil aviation came about from practices that were culled from actually doing it. So we're going to, so the idea is with the Artemis Accords is we're creating international law because we're going to be doing something, we're already going to be doing something, and we know we need to create some sort of rule or some sort of guideline or some sort of principle or protocol for it. Instead of creating the rule and protocol even before you start the activity, which basically constrains the activity even before it gets started. So, um, and I'm jumping a little bit ahead here. Let me go back. So, one thing I want to talk about before is I leave is the, I mentioned the Moon Agreement here, and I'm going to relate that to Australia. I think the Moon Agreement has been dead for a long time. There has been a resurgence of it, especially in light of uh, space resources. The building blocks, I feel, were heavily um, kind of Moon Moon Agreement light in a sense, you know, kind of an end runaround for the for the Moon Agreement, especially the international regime. We have the uh, the Vancouver recommendations, the that international letter that I mentioned. Um, these all were have been promoting the Moon Agreement. Now, I mentioned that, uh, in my list of states assigned, I had Australia last, and again, not because it's the least significant, because I think it's most important in the sense that Australia it had, has acceded to the Moon Agreement. And just a brief aside, in treaties, there are there are kind of three levels of of being a party. You can sign it, which means you're not legally bound by it, but you agree not to do anything that's contrary to it while you kind of think about whether or not you're going to actually ratify it. Ratification, which usually happens right after right after a treaty is initially signed, and that makes you makes a state legally bound to the precepts of the treaty. And accession or ceding to a treaty, which basically says, okay, you know, I've I've sat on the sidelines and watched this treaty and it's been a few years since it was initially set up for signature. I decided I'm going to become a, I'm going to accede to it instead of ratifying it you're going to basically accede to it which is basically the same thing which in my opinion is ratification after the fact so but it has the same effect of ratification it makes it legally bound so here australia is legally bound to the precepts of the moon agreement including the international the, the creation of an international regime for extraterrestrial resources i.e space resources especially when it comes to private individuals so I think, in my opinion, Australia's kind of put themselves in a conundrum where uh, they're trying to straddle 
both sides, you know, straddle, straddle a line and, and kind of compromise a little bit, you know, with moon agreement and space, the idea of space resources. Uh, I think, you know, the idea of space, I mean, space resources and the Artemis Accords in particular, I think are totally contrary to what the moon agreement puts out there in my, in, in my opinion. So I think Australia's kind of put themselves in a position, okay, we signed these, now what are, what are we gonna do with the moon agreement? So there's a very possible chance they could, they, in the sense say, you know what, we found, we found out the moon agreement isn't gonna go anywhere, which it isn't in my opinion. Uh, maybe we should, maybe, maybe this is the way to move forward and maybe we should remove it. Now, a lot of my Australian friends and colleagues who are watching this might disagree and great, I hope I, I, hope I hear some your opinion on it. And I definitely don't speak for the Australian government or any of my Australian friends or colleagues, but in my opinion, I think it's very possible you could see Australia actually uh, withdraw from, from the moon agreement. And I think you could see a few other countries too, when, once they look at the Artemis Accords and actually see this is getting things done, especially when it comes to the, pro to the potential of the uh, harvesting outer space resources. It's getting very real, and I think the Artemis, the fact that the Artemis Accords were signed, the fact that eight states and not just one or two signed on makes this extremely significant, in my opinion. And really, it's, it's uh, to basically put a phrase I put on, I, I put on Twitter, uh, basically, they knocked it out of the park. And hats off to Mike Gold and to the team at State Department that negotiated these. They knocked it out of the park. And if you, ever, if, if you haven't met Mike Gold, please, if you ever get the opportunity to do Great guy, real go-getter, and uh, he really he really came through along with the other, everybody at State Department on getting these accords signed. And to get eight states to sign on to him was is just it's just a grand slam, and I'm I'm ecstatic about it. Uh, again, this is this is sending reverberations through a, a lot of the international community because this is going to be a different approach. And I guess I guess an analogy is. Uh, from, from a business contact, uh, how to get a business deal done is you can do it one of two ways. You can have a fancy boardroom meeting, uh, a fancy formal meeting with, with the suit or, and to get business done. And chances are you'll get business done slowly. Or if you really need to get something done, you put on your, you put on your, golf, sh your, your golf shoes, grab your clubs, go on the golf course with the person you're going to negotiate with and get the deal done. I don't play golf. I probably should take it up since a lot of good business does get done on the golf course. But a lot of people I talk to but who, uh, who play golf say, you know what, I I, it's not so much enjoying the game as much as it's a good place to do business. So in a sense, fun, fundamental top-down treaties like the Outer Space Treaty and such are the corporate boardroom, the formal business meetings to get the deal done. The Artemis Accords and the, the, the agreements that are going to attach to it are getting business done on the golf course. Things will get done much faster. There'll be a lot more agreement will come a lot sooner and because it'll be just a couple people versus a lot of people talking at once. And I think that's gonna be very effective and I think we're actually gonna get things done. I'm very enthusiastic about the direction things are moving and taking. And the good thing about these, because there are multiple, because, because we have so many states that have signed on to it, that I'm not even I'm not gonna make any predictions about the, the upcoming election, but. Every successive administration could, in a sense, be bound by these by the Artemis Accords. And in fact, I think the Artemis Accords have set the the, the track for uh, space exploration and utilization for the decades to come. In the same vein that the Outer Space Treaty set the direction for space ex exploration and uh, utilization, I believe the Artemis Accords are going to do the same thing. And I think it's going to be extremely significant as we move forward. I mentioned my briefing of the pressy that I'm going to do a special issue on this in, in the next few weeks. And again, I'm going to invite you, if you want to become a subscriber, I would welcome you aboard. It, it is, a, it is a paid, uh, it is, is a paid description subscription. I do charge a price to try to keep it reasonable. Uh, basically what happens is I publish four quarterly issues a, uh, a year and I do special issues in between like this upcoming issue on the Artemis Accords is going to be a special issue because I think this is such an, important topic that I'm going to dedicate one issue where I can just spend a lot of, a lot of my time and pages on that one one matter. This is a good example here is the third quarter uh, 2020 issue, which went out on September 25th uh, to my subscribers. What happens is I, I don't have a paywall or it doesn't, you can't read it online. I send it right to your email in a PDF format and everybody gets it at once. And that's, and that's how I do it. And that's how I've been doing it for the, since I started this back in 2016. And it's been very nicely received. If you want to become a subscriber, but you're not sure, and you want a sample, 
I have an email there, info at the pressy.net. Send me an email. Ask me for a, uh, a copy of the Pressy to look at. And I will send, what I'll do, I'll send you the second quarter of 2020. I'm not going to send you the, the, the current version. Uh, that's just that's not how it works. And I'll also send you a special issue to give you an idea of some of the topics I cover in special issues to give you an idea. If you want to become a subscriber, I will get you caught right up with uh, the third quarter 2020 issue. And I'll also make sure you're on the list for the special issue on the Artemis Accords uh, when I get it out in the next couple weeks. So that's what I have. I'm very excited about this. And as pe people who know me well know that I don't say the term excited very often or get excited about things like this very often. But I think we're moving in a very good direction, uh, and I think good things are going to come out of this. So until next time, I'm hoping to do uh, – my schedule is loosening up a little bit, so I'll probably be doing a few more videos, uh, more than I have been in the past couple months. Uh, but until the next time, be happy, be safe, and we'll see you then.